I'm Samantha Engel. And I'm Aaron Gullius, and this is Great Lakes Lore. Sam, how are you? I'm feeling like a normal person again. <laughs> um, I, uh, as, as everybody will hear later, I had a ghost hunting adventure this past weekend. So it'll be two weekends prior to when you're listening to this potentially. Um, and it was late into the night, uh, Saturday night into Sunday. And so drove home Sunday. It was hours away. And I felt like garbage most of yesterday, <laughs> it, but I took took today off, took this Monday off, and um, feel I'm I'm feeling all right now. <laughs> yes, well, I, I I will say that that does tend to take it out of you if you are no longer used to that kind of uh, keeping that kind of schedule. <laughs> I was up until one thirty a few weeks ago, and um, it was terrifying. The next day, I was like, I, I can't function. This is. <laughs> This is bad. Well, but and it wasn't know. just being up, but it was like being out and active. Like, mm-hmm. you know, even though on Saturday I spent probably four and a half, I think, hours in a car ish, maybe a little bit more, maybe closer to five. I'm not no, I think it was probably like four and a half hours. Um uh I got still almost ten thousand steps, and they all occurred between the hours of seven PM <laughs> and midnight. Wow. And then but when I woke up then on um, Sunday morning, I looked at my phone and I already had 2,500 steps for the day because all of those happened between midnight and 1.30, 2, 2 o'clock, I guess. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> and lots of stairs, up and down stairs. There oh, were six. Boy. <laughs> six uh six levels of these cells in this old prison so i am yeah. excited to uh, to hear about this and and everybody will hear about this uh mm-hmm. during our midway break yes uh, but for right now we are we are back we had a, a little june hiatus mm-hmm. so we are back and we've got a, a a new run of episodes and topics that are delving into some areas that we uh that we have not uh have not touched upon before and today is uh, is one of those sort of new topics. It's kind of blends several. Like I call it like local legendy, which we've kind of done before, but um there's there's an element to it that's kind of new, I guess. So, um but we are going to be talking about the melon heads which I always kind of had a problem with. And now after researching this, I feel very uncomfortable saying, but we will be saying it throughout the episode. And so this started off as a Michigan topic that we're looking into. And I had heard about it for, for several years and seen it on like weird Michigan sites and things. Um, but then we found that there are also Ohio and Connecticut, not that Connecticut's a Great Lake state, but connections as well. Um, but we wanted to start off with a bit of a disclaimer um, because this episode will feature a discussion of people with physical abnormalities. Um, if you a melon head, um, a large, a large head. Um, by covering this topic, it is not our intention to perpetuate a long tradition of othering uh, individuals with uh, any kind of physical abnormality normality like this legend kind of ends up doing, but we hope at least that in covering this and um, talking about the, the story itself, we are able to counter that notion and um, you know you will you'll hear our perspectives throughout and largely at the end. So and I've got to say I knew nothing about this going into it and which which I love for for this show when I when I know absolutely nothing. And Within about two paragraphs worth of reading, I was like, okay, I've got some very, very strong opinions about what's going on here, as mm-hmm. uh, as as you'll hear. We have some strong opinions. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to start off with Michigan. Um, I guess that's just because we live here. <laughs> So so we're starting with Michigan. We took a lot of this background from the book Weird Michigan. And the the book states, For as long as anyone can seem to remember, tales have been told around Michigan of a strange race of subhuman creatures who live in the woods near the towns of Saugatuck and Bridgman. These mutated beings are known as melon heads because of their small bodies and disproportionately bulbous craniums. The book then goes on to say that children are warned to stay out of the forest because the melon heads will attack and even kill and eat those that they encounter. 
So the first section of the story, which takes up two pages of the book, uh, was written by a gentleman named Mike LaVey, and he explains that children were experimented on at the Junction Insane Asylum. The building was originally started by the state to treat children with hydrocephaly, which causes large pockets of fluid on the brain. But as they were treated, the doctors there actually experimented on them. These experiments, uh, LeVay claims, caused severe mental and physical issues and, quote, they became little more than wild animals as they continued to mutate. Eventually, the facility was closed and... The basically feral, as he says, children could no longer be placed in more humane institutions. Many of them escaped and others were let loose and began living on their own in the areas surrounding the Felt Mansion in Saugatuck. Um, And they continued to breed and have their own little community of of, um, hydrocephalic people. People who visit the area believe to see curtains moving in the old vacant building, strange noises coming from within, and for those who ventured inside, without permission it should be noted, reported hearing heavy breathing and tiny footsteps, as well as shadowy silhouettes. And I should say that when they refer to the vacant why can't I say the word vacant? I, it I sounds like I'm know. saying bank, bankman vacant. or something. I'm vacant. having I'm having yeah. issues today. <laughs> um, the old vacant building that they're referring to is that asylum um, and not the felt mansion. So also in the book is a story from Kelly Top Bedrosian. She stated that she used to go to the felt mansion at night as a teen, and at that time it wasn't restored. Well, get into that later. They were apparently exploring the grounds when they heard something rustling in the woods. They then saw a man with what appeared to be an overly sized head emerge from the woods about 50 yards away and saying nothing, started walking towards them. They attempted to talk to the man, but he only grunted in reply and continued towards them. They ran to the parking lot and drove away. And then she says, Several days later, I told the story to my dad, and he suddenly got very serious. He told me that I was never to go back to the felt mansion at night. When I asked him why, he told me the story of the melon heads. Kelly goes on to say, Years ago, the felt family sold the mansion to a seminary, and a small, insane asylum was built on the grounds. It was then sold to the state of Michigan, and the state turned it into a low-security prison. My father told me that the asylum specialized in patients with extra fluid in the brain, causing their heads to swell. After funding for the asylum was cut, most of the patients were set free. Many of the melon heads had already developed an intense hatred for normal-looking people and chose to stay on the grounds away from society, and they built homes out of the tunnels that run under the mansion. Supposedly, they continued to live there and interbreed for decades and still live there to this day. Finally, she ends by stating that the Felt Mansion has been restored, but that Agnes Felt died three days after the house was finished, and she is said to haunt the place to this very day. So with this story, uh, there are some some very easy things to research and and try to figure out here um, to see what's going on and uh, do a bit of good history work, which Aaron and I (laughs) enjoy doing. Sort of our thing. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And so uh, it seemed like the the first easy thing to do was to look into these buildings. So in this story so far, we have two buildings that are mentioned, the Felt Mansion and the Junction Insane Asylum. And it seems like even just from reading this, uh, these two accounts, they're kind of confused with one another, (laughs) aren't they? (laughs) Yes. Yes, they are. Um, So we know that the Felt Mansion existed because it's still standing today and operates as kind of an historic house. You can do self-guided tours of it, um, as well as a venue for special occasions. But what was it originally? Their website has a pretty good history on it, so we were able to pull that information. Um, It was built by Dor Felt for his wife, Alice, to be their summer estate for their family. And construction of the mansion took place from 1925 to 1928. Dorr had been born in 1862 and had honed his machine skills as a young man. He was famous for inventing the Comptometer, which uh, actually helped with accounting. Um, It's like a little typewriter looking thing that helps with accounting um, in office settings. So he invented this as well as some other things. So they were a very wealthy family. 
Uh, unfortunately, Agnes passed away six weeks, not three days, like our one story reported, after moving into the home, and Dor died a year and a half after that. Their children and their families still use the home as a summer estate, however. In 1949, the Felt children sold the estate to the St. Augustine Seminary. The carriage house of the estate was used for classrooms, and the house itself was used as dorms. Later, a larger school was built on the property, and the nuns lived inside of the mansion. Then decades later, the state of Michigan purchased the buildings and grounds, and other buildings were constructed on the site and used as a prison. The dilapidated felt mansion was stumbled upon by a pair of hikers, and they began a community effort to restore it, and the website states that that restoration began in 2001. So the big point we need to take away from the story is that the <laughs> felt mansion itself was never used as a hospital, never used as an asylum, never used as anything of that sort. Uh, the building and the estate went from residence to seminary to prison to falling apart. <laughs> so that, that is the story of the felt mansion itself, which often gets confused in these Melonhead stories. Now that we've cleared up the Felt Mansion, what about the Junction Insane Asylum? Well, apparently, a building everyone thought to be the old asylum was actually just part of the old Dunes Correctional Facility, and according to online sources, has now been torn down. The Allegan County Historical Society has asserted that there never was a Junction Insane Asylum, not that we had the wrong building as the Junction Insane Asylum, or the Junction Insane Asylum didn't do that sort of thing. They're simply, it, it wasn't. That story made up. <laughs> it, it, it's a made up building, a made up facility. It does not exist. Um, and, and this isn't super old stuff. I mean, there's people alive who would have remembered the Junction Insane Asylum, probably. Uh, probably the people who work for the Allegan County Historical Society. <laughs> They'd know. So with two of the buildings out of the way, what about the rest of the story? Although not mentioned in the Weird Michigan book, several websites we found mentioned that a Dr. Crow studied children suffering from hydrocephalus after World War II near Saugatuck, Michigan. Newspaper searches have yielded no results for a Dr. Crow in Michigan. MysteriousMichigan.com states that Dr. Crow is not connected to Michigan melon heads, but only to Ohio Melon heads. Stand by for Ohio melon heads. Mm -hmm. This website contains a few other submissions. One is from a Hope College student located in Holland, just north of this area we're discussing. And he said he and some friends were out in the area and they ended up seeing a four foot tall person with a large head standing in the middle of a clearing. Then they heard a crash in the woods and ran back to their car. I mean, there's so much detail to that story. I don't know how we could doubt its veracity. No, ab absolutely not. It, <laughs> the it's, moment I'm, they hear the crash in the woods, they just gone. <laughs> there, there's no question in my mind that that just any random crash is is you know a four foot tall person. With and a large the head. website did say that they were specifically going out there to look for the melon heads. So I feel like when you're going out specifically looking for a thing, you're just going to be freaked out. <laughs> And that is, unless I'm misremembering, that is going to be a recurring theme in some of the other stories that we see from elsewhere. It, it is, it is, there's the legend of the melon heads. And so we're going on a melon head expedition <laughs> to try to find, uh, try to find, um, well, I mean, people creatures. go Bigfoot hunting and they do. you know, things like that. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, but I feel like, especially if you're just some college kids with not a whole lot to do on a Saturday night and you decide to go looking for the little monsters in the woods, you're probably going to have something happen that leads you to believe there were little monsters in the woods. You predisposed yourself to it. Or you tell people you saw something, yeah, whether you did or not. Yeah. I mean, I'm not ashamed to say that this sounds exactly like something I would have done in college. And <laughs> May you know, in, in our Patreon bonus so. episode, you admitted that you would have just stuck vacuums by people's cars to freak them out. Now you would have lied about melonhead stories. <laughs> <laughs> there is no end to my depravity, Samantha. I mean, we should all know this by now. Um, we're all not like you, Sam. Some of us are evil. So <laughs> 
<laughs> There's another story on the website that actually connects the melon heads to the Cook Nuclear Power Plant near Bridgman, Michigan. But that's really the only connection to this we've really seen. You, you'd think that with a nuclear power plant in the region, there would be more, you know, radiation has, you know, deformed the, the children of the area into the melon head phenomenon. But it, it's, it's not something that comes up a lot. No, no. I mean, I, I think a few of the Linda Godfrey mentions that we're going to have later might allude to like, this is one thing that we kind of hear, but this is not the prevailing narrative. <laughs> When, when really it makes a lot of sense. More sense, um, I feel. Yeah, I, I think I think atomic contamination is a sensible cause for deformities. I mean, I'm no scientist, but right. I mean, I work in a in a town that has a giant chemical company <laughs> in it. <laughs> the, uh, the the jokes that can be made about mutated deer and squirrels and all kinds of things are, are just endless. So it seems like, yes, power plant is the natural. This this dates me a bit, but I, I, I can't help but think about the, the Simpsons episode where the three-eyed frogs start showing up in Springfield <laughs> because, because of the nuclear power yeah. plant. So. Yeah. so that's what's been going on in Michigan with the melon heads. When we come back, we're going to have some melon heads from elsewhere, and we're going to have some, let's say, strong thoughts about the entire melon head phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Next time, the Soper Relics. Yes, we're delving into the somewhat kind of sometimes CD phenomenon of mysterious ancient relics from the other side of the world showing up somewhere in America when mainstream history says they shouldn't be there. And we've got a bunch of them to look at next time. If you like what you hear on the show and you would like to support us, you can find us at patreon.com slash Chizo Media. Uh, the Patreon account is for the both of our shows, the Saucer Life, Aaron's other uh, show, as well as Great Lakes Lore that you're listening to. So obviously... You know that that is our show. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there you can find bonus content. We have uh, blog posts, research posts. Um, sometimes we take field trips and have videos, early access to our episodes, as well as a monthly bonus episode for each of the podcasts. And we have two tiers that you can choose from. So check those out uh, if you're interested. And maybe there is something that works for you. And if you just want to say hi, or you have a comment about this episode or any of our episodes, you can get get in touch with us via email at greatlakeslorepodcast at gmail.com, on Twitter and Instagram at Great Lakes Lore, and on Facebook at Great Lakes Lore um, Podcast. <laughs> that was the word I was thinking of. We'd love to hear your feedback and your comments and um, and, and just to uh, just to reach out and say hi. You can also listen to past episodes either in your favorite podcast app or at our website, greatlakeslore.com, where we also have some extra interesting stuff and photos that go along with the episodes that you can look at. You can find out more about me and Sam if that's something that interests you. Yeah, so get in touch and uh, check out the website and um, learn more about everything. All right. So we were going to take a few minutes to talk about my ghost hunting experience yes. because we thought that it would be relevant to the content of the show, obviously. And it was in Ohio. So one of our coverage states. Yes. <laughs> so I this past weekend or two weekends prior, if you're listening when the show comes out, uh, went to the Ohio State Reformatory in Mansfield, Ohio, and did a semi-overnight ghost hunt. The event ran from 7 p.m. until 3 a.m., and um, you kind of got free reign to explore the entire beautiful – I mean, the architecture of the building is just insanely beautiful, um, and all of the cell blocks, wardens – quarters, uh, all of it, all of it, pretty much. A few things weren't open, but most of it was open to us. <laughs> <laughs>
So I had some questions uh, sure. that might help guide this. So it was a ghost hunt, and you were given you were given free reign. Was there a a sort of any any sort of structured element to it with 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 meters and equipment and cameras and and things no, like that? There was not. Um, we at the beginning they did ask like you know who hasn't been here or would just like a tour before going in. And so there was a, I I would say there were probably 60 people there and we were then sort of divided into two groups, the people who wanted a tour and then people who had been there before. So clearly there's a contingent of folks who just keep coming back to, Mm -hmm. to ghost hunt there over and over and over again. Um, And the event was not cheap, I will say. So these are very committed (laughs) individuals (laughs) to their craft, if you will. Um, But all of the proceeds go to help preserve the structure. So I felt really good about that. Like nice, nice donation (laughs) Um, that, that way. But so we did get a tour first and then, um, and then we were left to our own devices and we could leave at any point. We could go out to our cars and come back in if we wanted to. Um, But yeah, I mean, we, we ended up leaving, I think at about one 30, I want to say, um, because we were just kind of like, all right, we, we felt content with what we, (laughs) what we had done. Um, myself and my two friends that I went with, um, none of us are by any stretch of the imagination, any kind of professional ghost hunter. Um, and you know, we were just kind of I was just as excited to explore an old building on my own <laughs> as I right, was right. Um, to to try and do some of the more ghosty things that we did do. So tell me us about the ghosty things you did. So I used the voice memo app on my phone to do a few EVP sessions in some of the different rooms that were supposedly um, – more active than others and in um, near a couple of the cell blocks. And my friends had purchased a um, EMF detector and a little point um, point and shoot thermometer type thing. Oh, right, um, I can't right, think of right. what you call that. Um, red thermometer. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I yeah. guess. I don't know. You point it at something and it'll tell you its temperature. <laughs> right. right. Um, so we could tell, yes, there is, in fact, air conditioning coming out of this duct. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cold spot. Yes, it is. It is. And which was which was nice because it was very warm and a lot of that building was very hot. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so that's all we did in terms of ghost hunty things. And we didn't really use that equipment very much either. Um you know, again, we were we were first timers, and all of us. My my one friend um, is also a museum professional, and then it was her husband, and so we were, like I said, just as excited to. I mean, and rarely in a historic structure are you able to wander on your own unsupervised. Very rare. <laughs> Very and rare. so it was really neat to kind of own your own experience in in that way and feel sort of the heaviness of the building itself. Because obviously it was a building that, I mean, it operated as a prison for almost 100 years. And, um, you know... Uh, Bad things happened there. People mm-hmm. who did bad things were there, and it felt it felt like a, a heavy space to be in. And so I think I was in awe of that as much as I was the possibility of potentially encountering something from the beyond. <laughs> did you encounter anything from the beyond? Um, there's one tiny semi weird thing that happened. Um, there's this one room that is a completely interior room. So a lot of a lot of the spaces have a lot of ambient light coming in from outside. And so rarely were things pitch, pitch black. They were very, very dark, but they were rarely pitch, pitch black. Um, But there's this one interior room that apparently has a lot of activity and the entity that's in there likes to sit in this one chair that's left in the middle of the room. Um, But people report being scratched, like all kinds of crazy things, Mm -hmm. voices, touched in general, whatever. And so there was a challenge to sit in the chair in the room for 15 minutes all by yourself in the complete dark. And I did this. <laughs> so, so you stole this poor ghost's chair. I did. <laughs> what were the um, consequences? All, so... I mean, I was nervous about it. Like when we first heard about it on the tour, I was like, oh gosh, I don't know that I'll be able to do it. And then I was like, no, we're doing this. Um, And so my friends left and I just sat in the chair and 
Um, experiencing that level of pitch complete and utter blackness is just something that's very unlike anything most people experience in your day-to-day life. Like your night is not pitch black. (laughs) No. Um, And so shortly after they left and closed the door and, and we had sat in there twice prior, all three of us just like on the floor doing some EVP things and um, never heard any type of, building noise no creaky floor no settling noise no nothing and shortly after they left in the corner i heard a like floor a couple floorboards kind of creak and i got pretty panicky (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then managed to calm myself down and then everything else was everything else was 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 pretty normal and i will say that i actually left after 10 minutes because i was sitting there and sitting there and i had wasn't timing myself so i didn't know how long it had been mm-hmm. and i knew that there was somebody else like waiting to come in oh, <laughs> and, I, right. and i also right. knew that my friends were waiting for me and so um i walked out and when they i was actually surprised it was the full 10 minutes honestly it didn't wasn't one of those like it felt like an eternity but it wasn't <laughs> it i it went quickly, I guess. So that, that was it um, as far as paranormal things. And then I went to listen back to my EVPs and because there were 60 people all left to their own devices, there's nothing that I can hear that I can be like, Oh, spirit voice, because you'd be in a room and like people would walk by outside or they'd walk past you or they'd enter the space that you were in. And even though everybody was very conscientious of what the others were doing, it, um, it's just too much noise pollution to really, uh, you know, have a good, a good feeling that what you got was something else. So, right. um, that, that, so there's nothing sense. in in any of them that I could be like, yes, ghost voice. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to go back in with a a much smaller group and some of that dedicated equipment that, um, or even that just totally still. guided, like charge double. <laughs> Right. And and have like a, a small fully guided experience, so you guys, so you know that you're not, um, uh, you know, stepping on other people's toes, um, right. making noise, causing floorboards to creak, that kind of stuff. Um, so so yeah, I mean, it was fun. I am so glad that I did it. It was so cool to be in the space, to learn the history of the building, to see the work that these um, volunteers are all doing to keep it going. Um, I would definitely recommend it if it's something that you're interested in. Um, and and I would do another ghost hunt. Uh, so I don't think I don't know that I would go back to one there just because I would want to try and get some more serious investigating done <laughs> yes yeah i think i think that i i'd, I'd like to too that the, the couple of times that i've done it i've found it very interesting from if nothing else from a what are the procedures that make up ghost hunting and, mm-hmm. and tell me about this equipment that you think does mm-hmm. this or that or, or indicates that and, and why these things um the, the downside is the, the the first one I went I went on with my friends Andy and Shelley. Hi, Andy and Shelley, if you're listening, is um, boy setting up the cameras takes forever, <laughs> and you, you don't think about the sort of setup and teardown time involved with with some of these elaborate um, ghost hunt uh, mm-hmm. ghost hunt experiences, mm-hmm. and then the time spent going over the footage mm-hmm. uh, as well. So. Um, being involved with aspects of it from beginning to end like that w- w- would be would be very interesting. But yeah. I, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, so, you know, conversely, when we did the ghost hunts at the museum that I worked at previously, um, you know, they were a paid ticketed events and people were brought in. Um, but we were divided into two groups and we were always with members of the paranormal team. And so, you know, there were a lot of different things that were kind of captured or that you felt or whatever. And that's because there weren't people just wandering, you know, through the whole space right. and whispering right. and and doing that kind of thing. Um, and so, and so that was a very different uh, kind of experience. But again, both my friend and I, who are both museum people, uh, you know, we really appreciated the opportunity to just wander, wander through this, you know, historic space. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and the, the pictures that you showed me, which you can't show in any sort of format with the show because nope. uh, Chizo, Chizo Legal has put looked at the set paperwork and <laughs> you're restricted from using that for anything other than personal use, but very, very cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the, the building itself. 
looks looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. I I enjoyed I enjoyed doing it, and I have enjoyed sharing my experience with others. <laughs> yeah, we're we're definitely going to have to get you out in a haunted house somewhere again. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, gosh, it's been too long since I've been in one and scared off all the ghosts. I'm sort of ghost repellent, <laughs> but uh, what I'm probably not is I'm probably not melon head repellent. So we should probably get back to the melon heads. All right. So now we're going to dive into the non-Michigan melon heads and we're going to visit our other Great Lakes state, Ohio, and talk about the melon heads of Ohio. According to the Weird Ohio book, the popular belief is that they were the result of secret government testing that involves strange experiments on human subjects. Whatever they were testing, the result was that the subjects' heads all swelled to enormous sizes. Like any good government conspiracy, it was decided that the best thing to do would be to cover the whole thing up. Several versions of the Ohio story all centered around the Cleveland area. A prominent figure in all of them is a Dr. Crow. And yes, that should sound familiar. As you remember, Dr. Crow was mentioned in relation to the Michigan melon heads in a few stories. And then someone said, no, no, no. Dr. Crow was only in Ohio. So <laughs> Dr. Crow is, he's, he's around, maybe. Uh, so version one of the story, <laughs> Dr. Crow has somehow managed to acquire people he subjects to bizarre experiments, most of which focus on the brain and head. Due to the severe trauma, the individual's heads are deformed and misshapen. Some of the experiments also included lobotomies. So these melon heads are rather laid back. Is that the, the are those the words that the uh, weird Ohio book actually used? Laid back. Um, no, I, I didn't plagiarize, <laughs> Sam. I, um, I they said docile, so ah, but I, I just okay. thought laid back. Was, yes, <laughs> they were they're very chill, lobotomized. <laughs> yes, experiment subjects. Uh, Even though Dr. Crow would occasionally lose a subject for a short period of time, he would always be able to round them up rather quickly and return them. So how did they get out? Oh, they were just, or is it just that there then were sightings when one of these just kind of it's popped sort of out for a time? Wa- wander off okay. or wander out of okay. the facility. Okay. Yeah. So version two of the story um, is focused on Dr. Crow's wife, the not first named Mrs. Crow. And we'll talk about first names at the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> this time, Dr. Crow and his wife are living in an isolated cabin in the woods and care for a group of children with hydrocephaly. Due to the swollen heads, mean-spirited locals began calling the children melon heads. While assisting her husband, Mrs. Crow began to care deeply for the children and they for her. When Mrs. Crow died, the children were devastated. They panicked and began running and thrashing about the Crow cabin. Dr. Crow attempted to calm them, but a kerosene lantern was knocked to the floor, which set the old cabin on fire. Fed by the old wood of the cabin, the fire soon engulfed everything, including Dr. Crow and all of the children. The ghosts of the children now roamed the woods. In another variation on this, during a fight, Mrs. Crow fell and was killed. Thinking the doctor killed her, the children turned on him, killed him, burned down the house, and then continued to live in the woods, living off of animals and occasionally attacking humans. So interesting that in this one, Dr. Crow is like, you know, he's, he's, he likes the kids. He's caring for the kids. Like, right. he's adopted these Yes. Poor children. Yes, he and his his wife, who the the, the kids like more than Doctor yeah. Crow. Well, um, moms. Yeah, <laughs> mom. um, they. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's such a it's such a different thing, and and the old cabin in the woods makes it sound like a lot longer ago than an era of government experiments or, mm. or, or things well, like that. I guess that. it could. Yeah, it could be. I it, guess it, I didn't think that, but maybe someone you. It, it, I mean. <laughs> In isolation from the other yes. versions of the stories that seem a little more sort of twentieth, mid twentieth century ish, um, I don't know, just it, it and have like asylums and laboratories and yeah. things like that. This is like a quaint little bucolic cabin in the woods with all of these children, and, and then it, you know it gets it gets violent yeah, and unfortunate yeah. and sad. Yeah. 
So the final version of the Ohio story is just about Dr. Crow, who supposedly performed illegal abortions in his cabin in the woods and, quote, even manages to find the time to kill a deformed baby or two in his spare time. Where'd that quote come from? The Weird Ohio the, book? Weird, weird Ohio. That's yeah. terrible. It is. It uh. was. Well, I, I, I took a picture of this and I said, Sam, send it to you. I was like, Sam, this is getting dark. Um, <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> The area around where the cabin supposedly was then is haunted by the cries of the infants. So apparently, Great Lakes lore, we cover the ghost babies. I, I was going to say, it's a recurring theme, the screaming <laughs> infant ghosts of yeah. uh, the Great Lakes lore yeah. Um, episode yeah. guide. Yes. So there, there are other variations on the story. There, there's one uh, where Dr. Crow was killed by his patients. Um or the, the children, or he committed suicide by hanging himself from a local bridge. If you go to the bridge, you can hear babies crying mm. on the bridge, the, the victims of Dr. Crow. Part of the weird Ohio entry was by Ryan Orvis, and he, was con- he contributed to the Melonhead write-up, and he discussed moving to the area in the mid-70s with the myth already being well-established at that point. And Orvis explained that he wanted to get to the bottom of the story and did research into Dr. Crow, whose name is also sometimes spelled K-R-O-H. And he said he found a local newspaper article, no date given, saying that he had been influenced by the work of Gregor Mendel and, quote, was experimenting on humans to increase the size of their heads, end quote, because that seems like a totally sane thing to do. Yeah, why? Um, why? Yeah, why? why? And influenced by the work of Gregor Mendel seemed strange to me. Do you know Gregor Mendel, Sam? Yeah. Wasn't he the The father? Making little um, squares. Um, uh, Yeah, the Mendel squares genetic. um, Yeah. yeah. Genetic things and and, um, heredity. Yes. Peas? Pea shoots or something? Yes, yes, Yes. pea shoots like that. And. And and here's the thing that that confused me. He always it's like plant stuff. That's I remember freshman biology class. Mendel was was plant stuff and and Mendel squares. I don't recall anything. I, I'm going to en- emulate Doctor Mendel and interbreed humans to get bigger. Heads. Well, yeah. Well, how does that deal with like hereditary genes and stuff? It, I, I mean, I'm not I, I I'm not going to claim to know Gregor Mendel's full body of work at all. I've I just remember it. from high school. <laughs> That's that's all I know yeah. too, and, so and I'm, I'm glad you remember it because it's 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 closer, more recent for you than for me. Uh, my intern and I were having a conversation at work about the Habsburg chin <laughs> the other day, and Grant and Mendel came as up as one so. does. Yes, <laughs> yes, the the whole yeah the Habsburg chin. Yeah. Now I have a theory. Gregor Mendel was the name used, but I wonder, I wonder if they meant Mengele. Oh. I wonder if they meant Mengele because that would make a whole lot more sense as far as hor- horrible ex- it do- it how <laughs> horrible ex- when I think horrible experimentation on humans Mengele seems Listen, to be This guy a- just says he was influenced by him. So maybe there's some weird thing that this guy I mean anybody can yeah. latch on to a weird little aspect of someone's work and then be like no this is what Mendel would have wanted. And it's like, no, this isn't really at all what this guy was doing. So I'm not, I'm no. not going to get too hung up on the Mendel thing. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not either. And I, it just, it just struck me as, as odd. And, and you know, you know why this is a particularly futile, um, futile, not feudal as in memorialism <laughs> like and surfs. stuff like that, futile, um, path of conversation, which we are totally leaving in the episode because. <laughs> Why not? It's because it's pretty sure there was no Dr. Crow. So that's <laughs> right, um, right. Um, so um, Orvis uh, does additional research. He looks into death records in the area, can find no trace of a person with the name Crow under any spelling, having been a doctor or having been um, had a, a, a cause of death that was anything related to any of the stories about Dr. Crow. Um, but he does acknowledge that he was, quote, hindered by the fact that he could not pin these events down to a specific time period or location. Join the club, Ryan. We, we've texted that to each other many times while looking yes, at this. Like, I was like, there are no dates for this. Texts that, that become in- increasingly all caps and sweary <laughs> as, as, we, uh, as we work through this. Now, he does learn 
that in the 1950s, there was a child with hydrocephalus who lived on the same road where Dr. Crow's cabin was supposedly located. There also might have been a man named Crow who moved there in 1957 and supposedly was working on a cure for tuberculosis. Sure. There is no apparent connection between the man and the hydrocephalic child, however. So the book includes a couple of of testimonials, a a couple of of eyewitness accounts of things. And um, here's one. At Wycliffe High School in the mid-60s, we heard a different version of the Melonhead story. Some kids were driving around one day and saw a Melonhead watching them from the side of a country road. They stopped and the Melonhead ran into the woods. They followed deep into the woods and came to an old farmhouse. On the porch sat a middle-aged couple and several melon heads. The kids asked what was going on, and the man explained that he had been a nuclear scientist during World War II. After the war, he married, but the exposure to radiation caused all his children to be born as melon heads. The government gave him a lot of money to keep quiet and bought this secluded farmhouse where they could live out their lives away from prying eyes. He asked the kids to tell no one what they had seen and never to return. Someone told this story at a party in the summer of 1964. Someone else thought they knew where the melon heads lived, so we all crammed into cars and headed out to find them. We got stopped by the police. When they found out where we were going, they gave us a stern lecture that there were no such things and that we should tell all our friends there were no melon heads. We were taken to the police station where we had to call our parents to come and get us. We all agreed that the police were so intense in trying to convince us there were no melon heads that there had to be melon heads. <laughs> God. If, if not, why were the police so upset that we were looking for melon heads? Because you're a bunch of punk ass kids. Uh, so there's another story uh, from the book. I know lots about the melon heads myth. I know the Dr. Crow story is sort of true, but there are some facts missing. First of all, Dr. Crow did exist, but he lived in the 1940s and was a dentist. There could have been another Dr. Crow, though. Second, full moons have nothing to do with their nasty behavior. Have we talked about full moons? <laughs> I've, I've not seen anything about full moons. Okay. All right. Didn't think so. I thought maybe I zoned out or something. <laughs> um, I know this from experiences with them and from experiences that others have had. My first experiences with what I think were melon heads was on the east branch of the Chagrin River. My brother and I were driving along Mitchell's Mills and I saw a quick flash out of the corner of my eye. I looked right and saw something by a tree. It was very blurry, though. I was so scared, I screamed, and my brother looked out his window. What the hell was that, he said. I guess he saw it, too, because he turned around at the spring, and we headed back. This was near Mentor Road, which is off of Auburn. From Jay. (laughs) It seems thin to me. Yeah. A a sort of thin story. But, again, I... At least it doesn't sound like they were looking for the melon heads. So that's kind of a point in their favor. But no, something out of the corner of my eye, it was blurry. Must have been a melon head. I I don't know, Sam. I'm not I'm thinking there might not be a lot here. Yep. Now, there's also some melon head action in Connecticut. Why Connecticut? Well, There is a geographic connection, as the website of the New England Historical Society points out. They said there are melonhead stories in northeastern Ohio, which was once part of colonial Connecticut. So if you're familiar with the Western Reserve, they are sort of using that to tie in the melonhead thing. It was at this point. Politically, they were connected, kind of. So it clearly, was, it, it makes sense that the melon heads the melon are heads in these both states are without result, being in the state in be- states in between. That's the, the part that makes no sense. Yeah, there, there's no sort of contiguous sort of connection there. But because Connecticut refused to give up its le- Western land claims for a really long time, melon heads. Um, yeah, the New England Historical Society, folks. So. Interesting stories uh, on that uh, website, and uh, most of the melon heads are in southwestern Connecticut, and according to the New England Historical Society, they look like small humanoids with oversized heads, and they rarely come out from hiding. They survive by eating small animals, stray cats, and human flesh, usually the flesh of teenagers. Uh, 
And for runaway teens or hikers who disappear, the melon heads serve as convenient explanations. So this is, I think, even a a, a sort of darker melon head story. They're, they're just like murdering kids out in the woods, you know, the, the flesh of teenagers. Well, you get after. that in Michi- in the Michigan stories, too. They said that they would eat people. So, yeah. The Historical Society says that the Connecticut Melonhead reports began after the Second World War. So that's that's consistent. As populations migrated from cities to suburbs, this next quote really sort of got to me. They probably reflect the New York exurbanites' prejudice and fear of isolated rural folk. So the Melonheads are part of the urban-rural divide built into the fabric of post-war American society or something. There are a couple of theories there about how melon heads found their way to Connecticut. One is that there was a family accused of witchcraft in the 1600s and banished into the forest where they survived and bred amongst themselves. After centuries of inbreeding, they mutated into melon heads. The other theory, and elements of this might sound familiar, is that the melon heads escaped from either Fairfield Hills Hospital or Garner Correctional Institute, both of which are in Newtown, Connecticut. A variation on that theme has the melon heads escaping from an unnamed mental institution in the 1960s. The building supposedly burned, some of the inmates escaped, and turned to cannibalism, which caused their heads to swell. So we've got official institutions, we've got a building burning down and the survivors fleeing into the woods. Um, We've got a lot of recycled elements, I think. So there is a story from the New England Historical Society. Back in the 1980s, a group of girls from Notre Dame High School in Fairfield, Megan, Sue, Kim, Deb, Jen, and Karen, decided to go out joyriding (laughs) after a Friday night football game. They got into Deb's Blue Granada and set off into the dark. After driving around for a while, they decided to go someplace spooky, Velvet Street in neighboring Trumbull. The locals had given Velvet Street the nickname Dracula Drive because of the strange things that supposedly happened there. Megan told her friends that, strangest of all, little monstrous humanoids with huge heads were said to live in the woods surrounding Dracula Drive. Why not try to find them? The girls drove down Dracula Drive. It's a lot of D's in a row. It's very alliterative, (laughs) yes. And parked the car. They left the headlights on and climbed out into the cool autumn air. The woods were very still and very, very dark. Other than the headlights, there was no illumination, no streetlights, no houses nestled among the trees. The girls were alone in the nighttime woods. Laughing with nervous energy, they started to walk down the road, hoping yet fearful of seeing the monsters who supposedly lived in the woods. After walking a couple hundred feet, they heard the car door open and slam behind them. The engine started and the car barreled down the road towards them. Someone had stolen Deb's car. The girls jumped into the woods to avoid the car as it charged towards them. The Granada's thieves were illuminated by the interior light. They were the size of children with disproportionately large heads and were clad in dirty rags. Their eyes glowed with orange light and they cackled wildly as they drove past the girls. The taillights disappeared into the distance. Now this story, this seems a little more fun monstery as opposed to like, like, like tales of, you know, traumatic human experiments and children suffering from physical disabilities. Right. Like this story, this is, if this is what the Michigan Melonhead story was like that, that would be fun. (laughs) These guys are, they're, they're kind of, I don't know what to say. Yeah. They're, 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 (laughs) they're, they're, they're they're pranksters. They're, they're having fun stealing cars. Okay. Maybe that's not super fun, but yeah, they're stealing. They're stealing Ford Granadas, you know, back in the eighties. That's leaving the high school girls, uh, you know, stranded or something. It's it's yeah. But this this seems is more like a, a you know like a fairy story or right. you know you know something something of that nature. That sounds not yeah. offen- terribly offensive. <laughs> right. This isn't like oh god, you know, we're exploiting this, you know, something that might have been, you know, a real mm-hmm. medical situation. Right. This is. These are some, you know, trickstery little yeah. mythical creatures yep. who are coming out to mess with you, yep. which is which is fun, yep. like you said. Yeah. So what do we do 
with a story like this, something that is clearly false or at least absolutely not demonstrably true (laughs) and potentially harmful. Let's look at the ways it's handled today and what, and what are some of the issues we find in these stories that, that tip us off to the lack of evidence and truth. Biggest one for us, no dates. Mm -hmm. Weird Michigan begins with for as long as anyone can remember, (laughs) which I, which is almost up there with old timey as Mm -hmm. as things that really kind of grind my gears. There are also other vague phrases like after world war two, you know, like today, (laughs) <laughs> is we are currently living yes. after World War II. The, the Ohio accounts are similarly vague. Um, they mentioned that the stories were linked to events in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. So after World, after War, II World War II, right? Mm-hmm. Um, confusing locations constantly. The, the association of the Felt Mansion with a very precise history in these stories is, is very frustrating because we know it was never used as a hospital or asylum. In fact, it was completed before World War II. No full name for Dr. Crow. If there was a Dr. Crow doing horrible experiments and we know about it today, we would know his full name, where he worked, exactly what he was up to. He wouldn't be this mystery figure, especially. The, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, that's it's, the thing that like boggles my mind the most is like, if this is a story, like a le- like a legend or whatever that people are sharing and it's rooted in some kind of truth or some kernel of and so but ah like if people knew that these experiments were taking place like to the extent that this is a story that's passed down to everybody why wouldn't we know this dude's name and why wouldn't we have a name for where he was working like exactly exactly uh, <laughs> exactly in an, because in in an the era michigan, yeah oh i was gonna say in the michigan stories it's not like they were not government experiments like when you look at the michigan stories like it, it's the government like sets up the hospital or whatever, and they don't know what Dr. Crow is up to as opposed to the Ohio, the one Ohio version where like the government was actually doing experiments on people. But yeah, Yeah, I I was just going to say, we, we, we live in an era where um, the experiments that were, were funded by the government or initiated by the government or even connected to other institutions like hospitals. We know about these experiments. There's extensive documentation. Scientists Mm -hmm. keep extensive documentation um, because science, right? And, you know, we would we would find these things. And 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 part of me thinks, well, Aaron, are you thinking about this too hard about, well, what documentation would there be about this this? No, that's literally our job. (laughs) It's literally our job. And (laughs) and and the history of horrific human experimentation is a dark one that mm-hmm. we are still finding ways to confront and and targeted specific populations more than other populations mm-hmm. in America's history. It is a serious mm-hmm. serious thing. And to to sort of just throw it out there as well maybe this is where the melon heads came from. No, the, we, we, this needs people like us who know mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. to stand up and say stop this. Mm-hmm. Stop this. Go back to the Ford Granada story. That was a good one. <laughs> Yes. Do more of that. So when I tried to do some research, some newspaper research, like on newspapers.com for any melonhead stories or stories of Dr. Crow or anything like that in Michigan, most of what I found, other than like <laughs> there were some competitions of like bald guys <laughs> that were called melonheads and that kept popping up and I found that delightful um, as I was searching for, you know, really gruesome stories. It was like, ah. That's fun. Oh um, yeah, that that that's real fun, Sam. <laughs> they were participating in it. It was like a funny thing. Publicly shamed. That's no, funny. no. It was not I'm kidding. Publicly I'm, shamed. I'm, I'm, Don't make I'm, me feel bad. Oh, no! I can't make <laughs> you feel bad. Uh, so, anyways, um, most of these articles came out since the year 2000, and they were things put out around Halloween. You know, talking about Michigan mysteries, haunted mm-hmm. things, blah blah, that kind of thing. And Linda Godfrey, who oh, we've can mentioned. I, can I just say, I did the same thing for Ohio newspapers, and I found much the same. I found yeah. exactly the same thing. Um, stories in the last 15 years, literally the same story, just published in different papers around Halloween, Ohio monsters. So, yeah. Uh, so Linda Godfrey, who we mentioned in um, – the Dogman episodes. I think that's all she's come up in for us so far. But in the Dogman episodes I, I believe a so. lot. I believe so. Um, 
weighs in on the Melonhead story. And I really take issue with her assessment. Um, she calls the story good. <laughs> it's a good story, the Melonhead Ugh. story. And she refers to it as modern folklore. She likens it to stories of other small people tales from other states. But this story, with its roots in othering a group of humans, regardless of whether or not it is a true story or not, is quite problematic to me. Like, mm-hmm. I, I take mm-hmm. big issue with this. I don't see this as like, oh, this is a good campfire tale. No, right. no, it's 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 horrible. Um, these seem like the kinds of stories that drew people to freak shows and sideshows. Aaron and I talked about this a bit as as we were researching the episode that like this feels like some element of turn of the century circuses mm-hmm. or something like that. And where p- someone who has some type of physical abnormality um, disease, you know, whatever it is, you know, they couldn't make a real living. So they were thrown into a sideshow and that's what the rest of their life was. But as we've been researching it, we don't find this to be the kind of tale that should be touted as like a freaky monster story um, that is continually told and retold and shared and plastered all over websites and things um, in the 21st century. We are moving beyond these types of prejudices. And if this, again, like we mentioned with the little dudes stealing the Granada, like that's funny and harmless because that's not being compared to actual people with some type of disability or abnormality or whatever it might be like like all of these melon head stories from um ohio and michigan are absolutely and the the the, there's a long history of of deformity being being portrayed as monstrous Mm -hmm. and um it this this plays into that prejudice and into that uh, in, into that stereotype, and you're right. It should not be touted as a oh Michigan monster story mm-hmm. in in our day and age, or honestly any day and age in which it was talked about, because this isn't some kind of thing from the 19th century that has, as far as we can tell, that has been around forever. This is a Mm-mm. recent thing, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things on top of everything else that bothers me is that. There's there's nothing to this. No, the, the, nothing. The, 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 there's there's nothing to the, there's there's no long standing myths we could tie it into. It's not Mm-mm. like the Nain Rouge, Mm-mm. where you can connect that to actual, you know, or I mean, actual as far as actual goes, you know, you know, um, you know, folkloric creatures from France who might have stories might have come over with the voyageurs and 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 whoever. There's some depth to that. I mean, we sort of picked apart where it went off the rails. But and even that ended up being problematic because today right, it's, it's right. you know, it or even when you reread the story, it's a colonizer banishing the red man. Um, so that's, that's even troubling and, and othering and whatever. So. And, and this is, is those who are, who are physically different mm-hmm. being banished to the wilderness so they can live mm-hmm. out their lives as the monsters they ov- obviously are because yep. of just look at them. They're yep. monsters. Yep. So at, at the, the end of the overview story from Mike LeVay in Weird Michigan, he wrote, is it possible that the melon heads have returned here to this lonely and abandoned place to live out their miserable existence in the only home they have ever known? No, <laughs> no, it's not. The melon heads are not real. The story itself is offensive. Books like this and and creepy story articles on the internet and in newspapers would do a a much better service to the public by attempting to investigate this story than they would by perpetuating it with this nonsense. I mean, we've, I mean, it's, it's two Google searches, newspapers. You you can do this. And that's the thing that bothers me so much, especially for books like Weird Michigan or, or again, these widespread, I mean, you know, these are reputable newspapers that are printing these stories. They're continuing this this horrible, <laughs> horrible um, stereotype or tale or, or whatever it might be, as opposed to, I mean, we've researched it for two weeks, probably, probably a week, really. And yeah. <laughs> it's not hard. It did not take some, it didn't take our master's degrees in history <laughs> to 
figure no. this out. <laughs> I, I could have done this with my undergrad stuff. Yes, folks. exactly. <laughs> Maybe high school. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what that's what I found most frustrating is that the story is so thin, but it keeps being retold. And then when you even have folks like Linda Godfrey, who, you know, is trying to do something with with Dogman, Beast of Bray Road, whatever. And she's weighing in on horrible stories like this, saying it's a good tale or whatever. And it's like, I, I don't know. I just feel like these are the types of really bad stories that discredit like all of the other conversations that could be had about strange phenomena and encounters and whatever in the realm of the paranormal. Absolutely. And I, I think I think what, what really gets me, like I said, is that it's not a good story. It's not no. a fun story. No. It's not... It's not a story with any sort of any sort of depth. Nope. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I did want to mention at the very end, you know, whether or not there are any possible real explanations to how this bit of disturbing lore began. Uh, some have claimed that the melonhead term was used by public school kids in Michigan in the Saugatuck area to refer to students who were attending that St. Augustine sem- Seminary. I almost said cemetery again, which <laughs> which will be cut out earlier. But earlier I said cemetery. Um, but these these the private school, basically the public school kids making fun of the private school kids and calling them melonheads, kind of like an egghead kind of thing. So maybe that's where the word was first used. And, you know, it spread from there. Um, Linda Godfrey mentions also in a 2010 article in the Herald Palladium out of St. Joseph, Michigan, that after the Weird Michigan book came out, someone came forward with a possible explanation. Godfrey states that the individual said, In 1974, he and some of his buddies from St. Augustine Seminary went off campus sometime around Halloween and put carved out pumpkins on their heads. They'd be in the woods near Saugatuck, and when cars drove by, they would jump out and yell, wobble, wobble, wobble. (laughs) And now, honestly, this feels like the most credible piece of anything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I. I, I I just I, the wobble wobble. wobble. I don't understand I, I why you'd yell wobble wobble. Like that seems like it'd be a thing that you would you you would physically wobble and not yell wobble. I would I would have a hard time <laughs> selling wobble 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 as something <laughs> people should be intimidated by. I you know I've I, I I've I've had a gig where my job was to jump out on a haunted hayride and and sort of try to scare people. Right, and it's, it's more difficult than you think. And, and I should have yeah. sold wobble wobble wobble. As, as far as explanations go, I, I think. One of the most credible might be uh, the one from the Weird Ohio book, where in the 1950s there was a kid with hydrocephaly who lived on that road, um, and 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 some people might have seen him and said, you know, it, that sounds, and that here's a kid with this horrible medical problem, and it's become this Kids story. Are mean. They are so they are they're the worst. The thing that. I found interesting is outside of these stories, I have never heard the term melon head no. used as any kind of, you know, any kind of alternate for egg head or like, nope. but I guess, I mean, I guess in these other articles from the, I think they were like roughly from the seventies or something when they were talking about the, like the, the bald guy melon head things like, you know, but I don't know. I mean, that's just something that I've never heard. So to have Melonhead used in these three different states, like around three sort of similar-ish type right. tales, um, that seems odd. And I don't like to believe in coincidences. So I don't like that is weird to me that that like all of these Melonhead stories, which doesn't seem like a common nickname or or, you know bad name to call somebody um for, for those to develop and i i think i mentioned to you earlier today before we started recording is, is that one thing that that's still really bugging me is the connection between michigan and ohio and connecticut and, mm-hmm. and like like you said these three and that's that's bugging me and i've got some potential avenues i'm going to look at to try to figure some of that out and i'll update everybody if i come up with any way this could have jumped from one place to another i i couldn't figure it out so far and it might come down to one person writing stories for a newspaper yeah, who could. lived in a couple different places and recycled the stories mm-hmm. um just with different place names yeah I, I i think the reappearance of a dr crow 
is a huge red flag yeah. that that something is is not on the um the up and up a a, a manufactured folk tale of mm-hmm. the melon heads um somebody's creative writing run amok yeah right right yeah I mean, yeah, like I said, I don't know, the the pumpkin story is the the best explanation for how this started. Because, I mean, even a pumpkin, a squash, it's kind of like a melon, you know, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it it, wobble, wobble, wobble. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Tales of the Melon Heads was written and produced by Samantha Engel and Aaron Gullius. Our music is by Raphael Crux. Great Lakes Lore is a Chizo Media production. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Until next time, don't get lost in the lore.